In this chapter, we're going to get into an idea called reproducible research, and we'll talk some about how to do it in R. So in this first video lecture for the chapter, I just want to talk about what the idea is, what reproducible research is. There are a few ways that this term is used, and I want to start by being very clear that in this class, we're going to talk just about an idea called computational reproducibility. You can also talk about reproducibility in the sense that somebody could go back and start your, your experiment new and do everything in the lab again and all of those pieces. We're not going to focus on that type of reproducibility in this class. Instead, we're really focusing on whether somebody else could take your results from the data and the code and the analysis part and go through from there. So the key question here in terms of is your research reproducible when we talk about computational reproducibility means could someone else redo your entire analysis once the data had been collected? To be able to do this, there are a few components you need. One is that the data has to be available. Um, and next is that any steps that were taken to get from the raw data that was originally collected to a clean version that you use as an input to your analysis needs to be there and documented. Ideally, that's through code. All of that's done through a scripted code process. Finally, you need to have any code and software available for the pieces that go through from your cleaned up code to your final analysis. And that might be code for fitting statistical models or creating figures or creating tables or things like that. In the past, a lot of times you would read scientific papers and the statistical analysis was straightforward and simple enough that really you could read the method section in the paper and you could figure out exactly how to reproduce it yourself. And a lot of times a version of the raw data was included in the paper. So you again could go through and do that with the components that were there. But a lot of statistical analysis methods have gotten much more complex. And a lot of the ways that um, that people analyze the data and, and the size of the data sets have, have just changed in such a way that in many method sections now, you can't do that just based on the text there. So by including code and making your project truly reproducible, that, that's kind of potentially the method section of the future where it's going to, again, allow somebody to go through and redo everything from the data you collected to the conclusions that you're drawing. So I just talked a little bit about this idea that these might be a method section in the future. Um, but I see when I use these tools and when I have students using these tools, it doesn't take long before they realize a lot of other benefits that they have for your research as well, especially in terms of making your research work very efficient. So one of the key ones of these, um, if you have been working in science for a while, I think you would probably agree with me that one of your main collaborators is your future self. So often you will have done a project and then you, you get it submitted as a paper and then six months go by while it's under the review process. And then when you get it back, you have to remember everything that you did in analyzing that data and in pulling the data together. By using reproducibility tools, it really cuts back a lot of the extra work to figure out what you did in the past once you're looking at it a little while from now. Uh, you get this clear progression of exactly what you were doing going from the raw data through all the steps of cleaning and then through steps of, of analyzing and creating figures and tables. Now that also means that if you need to make some changes, if you need to go through and run a sensitivity analysis, or maybe you need to change one figure a little bit, or maybe even somebody's recognized that um, there are some issues in the data and you need to adjust the data um, before you run through everything to do some kind of sensitivity analysis. In those cases, by having a setup in the way that we're gonna learn how to do, you can essentially make those changes at one spot and kind of press a button and everything gets put back together into the final version of the manuscript or the report. It's also very nice because when you are ready to publish, you can do these last checks to walk through everything and make sure that there wasn't something that you missed or that you, you had a small error on along the way. And it also makes it much easier to take the work that you're doing and share it with other people. Often you might do a project and somebody else wants to do a related one and they'd love to have a starting point in terms of, of code and analysis and how you created your figures. By using these tools, you'll have something you can very easily pass along to other members of your lab group or to a scientist you want to collaborate with. There's one example that, that, that happened probably about a decade ago now 
that really brought home both the importance of documenting all of the steps if you're cleaning your data and running your statistical analysis and all of that, but then also the value of different scientists being able to go back and reproduce the work that other people have done and look for for issues and concerns and all of that to make sure it's not just this black box of like, well, we got our data and we document it very well, everything in the lab we did to get it. But then we did the statistical analysis where you can't really follow all the details because there's not enough room in the methods. And then these are our results. And you need to kind of just take by faith what happened in between. So in this case, I put a little bit of text up from a New York Times article about it, but I've also put links through to articles that came up in The Economist and, and Simply Statistics about it. But it was a case of a genomic study, and it, um, it, it gave a surprising result, a very interesting result, and one, one that people wanted to build on, including the original research team and some other research teams. And so some of the other researchers wanted to confirm and make sure that this finding was really sound and valid before they moved it into, into trying to do some clinical tests with it. And so they wanted to go back through each of the steps. And they were able to get all of the data and they were able to get some of those materials um, for, for doing that kind of in-between stuff of getting results from the data. And once they started looking at that, this is Dr. Baggerly and Dr. Combs, they found that there were some issues. And um, the original team kind of attributed these in the quote that I put here as clerical errors. And it was things that seemed small, like small offsets in the spreadsheets. But what ended up happening is that sometimes gene names were kind of like off by one row with all of the data. And as a result of that, the, the implications and the interpretation were, were very far off for some of the, the outcomes. So some steps that, that are really important for making your research reproducible and that we'll be covering some in this course. First of all, you should keep all of your raw data and you should keep it right in your project directory. We've been working some with our projects and they are a great tool for reproducibility in terms of keeping together all the materials for a project. So you shouldn't have raw data somewhere else. You should have it right there in that same project where you can find it easily. Then you should have all of the instructions that go from the raw data to a cleaned version. Sometimes you will have very large and, uh, data sets where you need to do some pre-processing. So, um, for example, I work with some people who do flow cytometry data, and they need to go through and they need to do some processing to identify different cell populations and count them. And some of that takes a long time to run, so they don't want to rerun that every single time. But it's really important for you to include some record of how you get from that original raw data to the clean version you use in your later analysis. Now the ideal for that is to do all of that through code and include your code script that got from the original to the end. If there are any steps that are kind of by hand, like where you might open a spreadsheet and change a number there, again, I, ideally you would avoid all of those. If there's something that can't be avoided, you want to document very, very clearly any of those kind of non-scriptable steps that you did and include that in your project directory. Again, you really want somebody else to be able to take that project directory without you standing there and, and explaining to them what happened and be able to go through and see exactly how you get from the raw data through to the final products that you're giving um, in terms of analysis and interpretation. Another point here that's also important is that you should include the details for the software that you're using along the way for any analysis. So um, packages do change. The base R software of R, it changes slowly, but it does change. If you want something to be truly reproducible, you want to try to include the version of each package that you used along the way. And then that lets somebody go back and if there's a problem when they try to rerun it, they can go back and get the older version. Maybe it's been updated since you originally did it and they can see if that's the thing that's causing the issue. We're gonna cover some different tools for reproducible research. We're gonna focus on some of the more basic ones, but I do wanna talk with you some about some of the other ones that you could potentially find in use. We're gonna be using something called Knitter in this class. This will allow us to create files that include both the code and the text. So they're interwoven right in the same file, and that means that when you create a report, it's rewriting a lot of the code every time that you do it. And so you can go back and change that code and then just click the button again and it rebuilds the whole report for you with any modifications you made. There are also some components that go along with Knitter. 
So there's some that are related to visualizations like animate. And then there are also some really good ones that I'll cover a little bit as we get later in the class that have to do with creating really fancy and interesting tables. So those include X tables, Pandar, and Cable Extra. Finally, there are some package that, packages that have been created just to help with this kind of versioning issue with packages. So these will actually take your analysis and keep a record of the, the packages that you are using and allow you to rerun that later where it will install the version of the package that you used the original time that you that you ran it. So PackRide is one that's been around for a while for that. And then um, I haven't used this a lot yet, but I understand that the R E and B package is, is kind of um, something that, that is supplanting that and is trying to advance some of those ideas. Today, we're going to fo focus on Knitter. And with Knitter, we're going to use a file type called an R markdown file. So in the rest of the video lectures, we'll be talking some more about the principles, but really focusing a lot on the practical details of how to use Knitter and then to use that type of file.